Hi everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to watch this presentation. I'm going to talk about my view of what our brain does when presented with limited information and how this may exacerbate depression and anxiety. So uh, the title is, I bet I know what our brain and lefty says when presented with limited information and how to challenge them. So uh, we'll hear about lefty right here is my vision or my image of what my lefty uh, looks like. Depending on how I'm feeling, lefty might often say things to me like I messed up. And the goal is to learn ways to uh, not listen to lefty, give lefty a different narrative and end up feeling better more of the time. So today we'll first talk about what the brain does when presented with limited visual information and uh, show that the brain is really good at filling in gaps, at predicting um, what will happen or making a story. Then we'll point out that language is processed in our left hemisphere and what that does to inform lefty our narr narrator and I'll give an example of how lefty behaves when we are depressed talking about some examples that I've experienced and we'll end with some tips on how to better inform lefty and kind of cut him off before there is uh, his negative self-talk so what do you think this says you might have said neuroscience rocks. Oh, so close. What does this say? Is this what you thought? So right there, we can see that, uh, you know, through our experiences, we can take limited information and predict what we'll see. And that is based on our experiences, in this case, reading, but lefty will, or our brain will uh, make other inferences based on previous experiences. So let's look at this cartoon. Here's someone walking and sees some tracks. We might make uh, some assumptions about what this person is doing. Now we see the person running, happily running in the direction they think the tracks are going and runs into this image. Now what would you do? Which tracks would you follow? And which tracks would you follow maybe if you were worried about your safety? So he or they decide to, to follow the small tracks. Ooh, and was it a good idea? Well, it looks like this in the end, maybe not, because the small tracks uh, were of the owner of this big, mean-looking um, monster, where the, the big tracks were actually what might look like a harmless bird. So we took limited information and uh, made some assumptions uh, that then led to different behaviors. Here's one more. We see some tracks and you might make some observations. We look here as these tracks continue and now we see what happens later or in this third panel. And you might look at this and be able to create a story of what you think could have happened. But that's making quite a few assumptions based on the limited information you see. And again, this shows that our brain is pretty good at doing this 
In fact, we do it all the time in different facets of our lives. Okay, if you close one eye, can you see in three dimensions? I don't know if you've, it, it, you know, I look around and what I see does looks no different than when I have two eyes. I can cover the other eye. To me, it looks no different. Give it a try. And yet, actually, can you see in three dimensions when you close one eye? And the answer is no. You can't get depth perception. And yet, when I look around, it looks like nothing is different. And your brain is filling in that third dimension because it's used to seeing in three dimensions. But we know, or you might know, if you try to uh, shoot a basketball, are you really good when you have one eye closed? Or if you try to walk up steps, do you know what might happen when you close one eye? Give it a try, but be careful with the steps. So it shows that we're actually not getting three-dimensional or depth information, and yet our brain is really good at filling it in. One fun example of testing this uh, that you might want to try if you have time is there's a dragon illusion where uh, you can print this out if you click on this dragon sheet link and you cut it and you tape it to make this dragon. And then you'll cover one eye and look at the dragon and rock back and forth. And in many of you, something unbelievable cool will happen. And you might end up getting a friend for life. So if it happens, you'll know. And then you might explore what happens when you move around or back up. And you, uh, like I said, it might make you smile. And you'll have a friend for life. And... It really is showing what our brain can do when we lose depth perception. Um, if it doesn't happen for you or you don't want to cut it out, um, watch this video. The other example that might be interesting for you is if you listen to this NPR radio story about a woman that um, could not was born in a way that she could not see three dimensions. And then... Uh, so never had that experience of three dimensions. And so her brain couldn't fill in that third dimension. And then uh, through some therapy, she was able to gain the ability to see three dimensions. And um, she talks about what it's like to actually experience a snowfall in three dimensions when you've only seen it before or experienced it before in two. So... Um, Feel free to read that. Okay, well, what have we learned so far? Your brain is great at filling in when the, it has limited information about the world. And I have some other examples if you ever want to contact me. And so, does our brain fill in and make assumptions when it has limited information that's not visual, or is, or is this ability just stuck um, in the visual system? And I've kind of alluded to the answer. The brain does that. It is wonderful at making stories. So to help us understand the ramifications of this and kind of how I view Lefty, who's this narrator in my brain, is just to point out that we're looking down at an image of the brain, so looking down from the top, and you might know that your brain has two hemispheres, two sides, one on the left and one on the right. And language is processed in your left hemisphere. So your right hemisphere does a lot of things, but the ability to process language is on the left to form sentences and to say sentences. 
and understand language is on the left side of the brain. So we have these two hemispheres, and how do they talk to one another? How do they connect and, and send signals to each other? Um, and I'll show you that soon, but I guess here I wanted to say that um, you also might know, just to connect to something that you might have heard about before, that the, the left hemisphere controls the right half of the body in terms of movement and sensation, and the right hemisphere controls the left movement and sensation of your body. And so to do that, information has to cross. Um, uh, and it, that information, which is sent through cells called neurons, crosses in a few places, but the biggest place, kind of the what gets processed in the top of our brain, crosses at what's called the corpus callosum. It's a connection between the um, right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And it's colored in red in these images. Now this is pretty amazing that if you snap your fingers, one second, two seconds, three seconds, for uh, the neurons in your brain will send four million impulses, if you add them up, a second, processing information that you're thinking about um, and the, or the, um, there's about 200,000 neurons that cross to send information back and forth. To me, that's an amazing little stat of data. So, what might happen if our corpus callosum was cut. And this may sound gruesome. Um, this procedure is still done rarely, but it's if someone has intractable epilepsy, that this might be a procedure that would um, restrict the, the epileptic seizures from spreading to the whole brain. And this procedure was done um, in the 50s and 60s, and gave us insight into um, the function of our brain and how our brain is so good at making up stories. So, we've established that there needs to be connections between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, and the left hemisphere processes language. And so, if that connection was severed, can information gleaned in the right hemisphere be conveyed to the left hemisphere and transfer into thoughts or language? And so it says, um, I'm saying, if, if the right hemisphere had information, could the left hemisphere, could your body verbalize what that information was or understand mentally what that information was. We have kind of, uh, you can close your mouth and think up different thoughts. You could even recite a story or anything you wanted to recite. And that talking to yourself is using language and so it's processed over here processed on the left hemisphere. And what they found um, through these experiments is even when the left hemisphere does not have information, these individuals will make up stories like it does have information. And they won't even realize they're making them up. So it's not like they think they're lying. They think they're, they know these things. These things are to be true, and they can um, uh, talk, verbalize things that they would have no knowledge of, but they're, um, uh, because the information was being processed in the right hemisphere, but they would make up a story to make sense of, of the information they were given. Okay, 
So results from, from these experiments, which I'm happy to show you more, um, is that on the left side of the brain is kind of what some people think of as the narrator or the interpreter. And I like to call that interpreter as lefty. It kind of helps me um, wrap my head around it. Lefty gets information and will create a story to make sense of that information. If the information Lefty gets is limited, it will guess and make up the story anyway. And often the guesses and interpretations that Lefty makes are wrong and they're influenced in uh, and can exacerbate individuals that are challenged by anxiety and depression. So, some examples that you could think through as you walk out of class and you see a friend in the hallway back when we could be in person. And this friend turns around and glares at you or looks really angrily and then turns around again. And how might you interpret what just happened? Do you think maybe you might think you did something wrong or that that individual was mad at you? Do you know exactly what they're feeling though? Could they have seen something behind you and been reacting? Or could they have just realized they left their cell phone in their previous class? It might not have anything to do with you, but who knows what story Lefty will make up. Here's another example. You text a friend and get ghosted, if I know what ghosted really means. But what might Lefty say? Again, they were mad at you. You said something wrong. You, uh, you know, it was something potentially that you did wrong. And it might not be that at all. You don't know. So, I am challenged by anxiety and depression. I view it makes me who I am. It makes me more empathetic and gives me my unique view of the world. But it doesn't mean it's always fun. And I just wanted to say three examples of, of when I was challenged by depression or dealing with depression what Lefty did to kind of exacerbate that and continue negative thought patterns. So here I'm, I'm an instructor. Um, I've gotten different awards for being a good teacher. And yet one time when I was really depressed and anxious, I was asked to give a lecture, a talk. And I thought, if any faculty member observed this talk, that I would get fired on the spot. That was the story that I made up. That if I gave this talk, I would be immediately fired. And it was bad enough. This is the only, first time I ever had to do this, and hopefully the only time. But I completely made up a story why I couldn't give that talk for like two weeks because I was convinced I would be fired. Another time, uh, you know, when I'm teaching, I might see students that are sleeping or not looking at me or maybe on their cell phone, and I can interpret that as, gosh, I'm a boring teacher, or what I'm saying is stupid, or I can't believe they're in my class and, and they're going to, what are they going to say on my evaluations? And it could be that there are reasons why certain individuals are really tired. Maybe they're really interested in what you're saying or want to participate in class, but their body needs sleep. So uh, you don't know what the reasons behind their action, and yet it is, that doesn't stop lefty or my lefty from making assumptions. And, and why I put this down here, um, in this case, people are waving high, but in this example, 
um, I, I was dealing with an episode of, of depression and a faculty member came in just to chat, came into my office just to chat, just to see how I'm doing. And I immediately assumed when she showed up at my door that I had done something wrong and she was going to ball me out for the horrible thing I did. And, uh, you know, we chatted, it was nice. And I kept waiting for the shoe to drop for her to say, but Brian, you cannot keep doing this. You know, it, it, you, I, I made up this, I had it in my brain that she was there to ball me out. And in the end she left and she was really there just to chat. Just to, just to say hi. And yet I completely misinterpreted and, and lefty kind of focused on, on a negative outcome. So here's a view of, of what the narrator might be doing. I can even read it, even though I know you can read just as well as I can. The interpreter creates the illusion of a meaningful script. Working on the fly, it furiously reconstructs not only what happened, but why. Inserting motives or intentions based on limited, sometimes flawed information. And yet it does it so quickly. And often we don't even realize that, that that's not the only interpretation. And so um, some things that I work on and uh, might be good for some of you to remember is notice lefty at work. Acknowledge what he might be saying or she might be saying to you, but realize that's not you. That's lefty. You can kind of acknowledge it and say, oh, lefty, you know, I can see why you might think that, but... I don't really think that's right. We don't really know. Second way is actually to correct him. Try to get some facts. You know, if you think someone is pissed at, off at, at, at you, ask them. Try, or, or even if they're ghosting you, ask a mutual friend. Is, is Lefty going overboard? And finally, help Lefty be a better storyteller. Give Lefty those facts. Make up a new potential story that isn't negative. And that can be really hard to do. But give it a try. Because you don't know which is the more accurate depiction. And if you're dealing with anxiety and depression... Your, often your first instinct is it's negative. And so if, it's, if you always are thinking it's negative, it's actually not true. So try to give Lefty better info. Thanks a lot for listening. If you're at all thinking about hurting yourself, there's a suicide prevention lifeline. Here's a number. There are lots of resources at UW Bothell Counseling Center that can be accessed in a confidential way. And, and I do realize that reaching out is incredibly hard. It is incredibly hard, but there are so many people that love you and respect you and are inspired by you that want to help you break away from lefty and get your brain on track to being a team member versus working against you. Thanks, everyone. Hang in there.